You might get set, go. Hi, I'm Alexis with Living Energy Farm, and now we spun off Living Energy Lights to sell solar products. We're doing class number two about how DC microgrids work. We have an audience here, although mostly you folks out there can mostly see me. Um, so uh, the standard uh, disclaimer we always do, I am not teaching you how to be an electrician. Electricity can hurt you. You can uh, burn your house down or get shocked. All kinds of things can happen. So if you're doing stuff you don't know how to do, we are not responsible. This is educational. I am not teaching you how to be an electrician. You need to go hire an electrician if you are doing uh, serious electrical work that you are not, uh, do not have the expertise to do. But we are going to undertake an educational uh, class here to teach you how DC microgrids work. Um, so just very briefly, we're going to do a quick overview of how energy works, particularly electrical energy, um, in the big bad world out there and what's different about Living Energy Farm. Um, so Living Energy Farm, this is a quick and dirty little drawing. Uh, we left out the fruit trees out here in the yard, uh, in the gardens, da 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 da. But we got our, I've got a building, we've got our uh, series solar panels. You remember last time we talked about um, series and parallel. Uh, well, one thing that's unique about Living Energy Farm is we actually have about eight different electrical systems kind of meshed together in different ways. Um, the biggest system is a high voltage system uh, with six solar panels, and that runs our industrial motors. We'll talk about what that means uh, in a minute. But we got one wire that comes down. This is 180 volt DC, although I'd recommend 90 volt would work better in most cases. Goes back to our well that supplies all our water. That's for the house, that's for irrigation, that's for everything. Uh, we got wires that come to the house that run a big blower that pulls heat off of hot air solar collectors on the roof. Uh, it comes down a set of ducts, goes under rock under the floor, back up, back up to the roof. So that air just goes around and around all day long. Uh, that's called daylight drive, just a DC motor hooked straight to the solar panel. Sun comes up, motor runs, pulls the heat off the uh, roof, puts it in the floor. That's thermal storage, dirt cheap. Um, uh, again, with the well pump, that's a DC pump. Uh, photovoltaic panels, solar electric panels generate DC electricity. That's drawn as a straight line, AC is drawn as a sine curve. Uh, so the DC electricity coming off the straight off the solar panels runs our well pump, and then we have a somewhat larger water storage tank. Um, we have a bunch of shop tools out in the shop. We got a drill press and lathe and bandsaws. That all is running off the high voltage system, all off of that same rack. We can overload this system 300%. It's very flexible, uh, works great, and it's all very self-contained. Uh, it generates probably 95% of our space heating. Uh, so the solar hot water, we've got uh, hot water tanks inside the house, a separate set of hot water collectors out here with a separate little PV panel that comes down and runs a tiny little pump. It's just like the, uh, the heating system in that it's a closed loop. Uh, the hot uh, liquid comes from the uh, hot water collector on the roof down to the tank through a heat exchanger back up. Uh, and the PV panel, solar electric panel that drives that is right next to the, to the heating panel. Uh, so that's a, another enclosed system. Uh, in the house, we do lots of charging. Uh, we have two separate PV panels. Uh, one PV panel is a low voltage system that comes over to the house. Uh, that handles all of our lighting. We use nickel iron batteries. We're not going to talk much about nickel iron batteries today. Just to say that one PV panel, it's a 260 watts, I believe, provides all the lighting and charging uh, needs for all of the uh, DC LED lighting, computers, smartphones, all of that for about a dozen people. We, say, we usually say 10 people as our average population, but these days it's more like a dozen. So one PV panel does all of that. One PV panel goes to a fridge. Um, uh, Sundance or DDR165, great fridge. Again, just like the house, it's thermal storage. So you've got a DC motor uh, running that fridge, chills it down during the day. It, instead of having this much insulation, it has that much insulation. It gets cold, it stays cold. Uh, so that big high voltage system is one system. We've got a low voltage system going to the fridge, a low voltage system going to uh, the lighting and charging stations. We've got uh, three systems actually on the hot water. Uh, a funny little quirk about hot water, uh, everything these days, just as a matter of philosophy, tends to be aggregated into big systems. Uh, well, sometimes that makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. So what happens with solar hot water in particular, you notice it more with solar thermal systems than with solar electric systems, but the difference between summer and winter is huge. Uh, so for any solar system, especially solar thermal systems, you can cover, you know, half of your demand with, you know, 
let's say in, in three by seven, three foot by seven foot flat plate collectors, just as, as a unit of measure, that, that collects heat, cover half of your demand with two of those. You'll cover 60% by adding another, 65% by adding another. I mean, the numbers aren't quite right there, but there's a tremendous diminishing return there. One little panel will cover you for six months out of the year. So you end up adding a lot more hardware to try to cover you through the winter. Um, and that's true for all of these systems, but especially for the thermal systems. And you basically have to decide, you know, how much, uh, how, how much are you going to spend to knock off a few more percentages in the wintertime. So it's a balance of what you can afford and what you can do. Um, uh, but with the solar thermal especially, so there's a few months out of the year, and with the household heating too, when you're kind of running at the edge, you know, you're staying warm enough, warm enough, but maybe you're going to burn a little firewood, have a little wood stove to make it work. Um, but with solar hot water in particular, the difference between a 100 degree shower and a 100 to 120 degree shower in January is the difference between heaven and hell. Um, it really is not pleasant to have a tepid shower in January. Um, and uh, uh, so if you've got an aggregated system, everybody when we're designing this project, every solar hot water system I've said, it's like, so we have a total of eight flat plate panels here. Those are three by seven panels. Um, everybody would say in the traditional design world, make that one big system. Well, we made it three systems, uh, two systems on the house and one on the kitchen. The advantage of that is somebody comes into the kitchen and they wash a bunch of dishes in the middle of winter. They're taking uh, the 100 degree water out of that uh, tank that's at the kitchen and using it up in 100 degree water. That's okay to have your hands in. And that 120 degree water that's still in the house is still there. They didn't use it up washing dishes or doing laundry. Uh, so for hot water systems, they're better off being broken up. Broken up For electrical systems, they're better off being broken up. The fact that our, we have all of these different systems means that if somebody does something stupid, uh, like, I don't know, somebody short circuits the refrigerator. Okay, well, that's an annoyance. Got to go deal with it. But it doesn't mean the lights go out. It doesn't mean the water system goes out. It doesn't mean I can't use my shop tools. So this is kind of the opposite of the way normal energy systems work in a lot of different ways. And I don't think very many people, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about normal energy systems, but I don't think very many people understand uh, how the big grid out there works. So we're just going to go over that really quickly just to give you some uh, points of reference here. Um, so there are three, three sort of backbone components of the big grid out there in terms of energy sources. We know what they are, right? Come on. Where do we get our energy from for electricity? Coal, nuclear, gas. Coal, nuclear, gas. Solar, electric, wind, all of that. They talk about, oh my God, we produce so much this month. They're talking about you know, a little bit. It's coal, nuclear, gas that does almost all the work. So what happens in West Virginia, you see what happened with Living Energy Farm. We got an integrated little farm here and all the rest of the world is left at peace. We're not burning coal, we're not burning gas, we're not burning nuclear power. So what happens in West Virginia, they blow the top off of a mountain to get to six inches of coal. There's a little river where the fish in it, well it's gone, they fill it in. All the valleys between the mountains, boom, it goes away. They bring in the bulldozers and dig up the coal. They dig up that coal, then they have to have a road to take it to a big power plant. Anybody want to take a guess? So the big monster power plants out there, across the board, what is the efficiency of electrical generation in the United States? Anybody want to take a guess? So if you took the amount of energy in the coal, the amount of energy in the uranium, the amount of energy in the gas, what did you say? 35. 35, you hit it right on the head, 35%. So what happens is they got a big furnace there that burns that coal, I'm not sure the exact temperature, I think it's around 1800, 2000 degrees. So we get 1,800 degrees, we're going to pick that number. High pressure steam at thousands of pounds of pressure, at least 100, uh, turning a big turbine, right? Generating electricity. And then we got to have uh, step up transformers to take that, because uh, those big, uh, uh, big power towers, you know how much the voltage is on those things? Anybody take a guess? 500 is, a, is well, most of them. They run 300 to 800, but I think most of them are around 500. So you lose more forest. They were going to build a big power tower system through here back in the 90s, and we stopped them. Power towers. Okay. And then for the uranium, out where we took, uh, what we did our project in um, Arizona, the Navajo out there have lived with massive uranium mines. These things, are, you can't hardly see the other side of them. And, of course, they leave the uranium waste all around, which the Navajo people have been breathing and the Hopi and getting cancer and whatnot. Massive coal mines. They bring that out. They bring that to a nuclear station that also runs at 35% efficiency. Same basic thermal conversion, though. They burn it at thousands of degrees or generate thousands of degrees to generate high-pressure steam, to turn a turbine, to turn a generator, to turn a high, 
uh, a high voltage transformer up to the power lines. So those power lines tie in here, okay? Now what's happening now, uh, we got to take this forest out, right? Because uh, frack gas, uh, all the rock underground, they come in, they frack that gas. Uh, there's a big conversion going on now to gas because theoretically it burns uh, cheaper than, uh, uh, cleaner than coal. The problem is that when they, f they do these lateral fracking here, a little bit of the gas comes up the pipe and most, a lot of it comes right out of the ground. Uh, so the fracking business is putting huge amounts of gas uh, into uh, the atmosphere. So they send that to yet a different power station. Uh, again, 35% efficiency there, same process. The same mechanical process of high pressure, you know, high pressure burn, high pressure steam, mechanical turbine, electricity, high voltage electricity, same thing happening in all these plants. Although they do have peaker plants and whatnot that run, they're a little different, but in any case, more, uh, more big power towers. And of course with the gas, they often have to pipe it so all the fire forest that was along the way, along that pipeline gets wiped out. All the forest along the, uh, along the routes of these power cables get knocked out. So the solution of our mainstream environmental groups uh, is to not challenge the wealth and power of their middle class donors. Uh, so they're going to leave all that in place. Okay, Living Energy Farm doesn't need all of that. We just wiped out all the forest and trees and all the way around us. And it's not a joke. I think, I'm going to say this every time somebody films me. 200 acres away from us, two, two miles away from us, 200 acres, got wiped out. I listened to the bulldozers for a year while they're bulldozing the whole thing, haul the trees away, burn the stumps, so they can take away our lovely forest and put up photovoltaic panels. Oh boy, except the carbon output of that is as high as those coal mines because you burned all the stumps to build it. And this is our solution. Now mind you, all of this goes through yet another step-up transformer so it can tie into these power lines come to the house, there might be some grid tie stuff on the house, okay, to go into a house that's badly insulated. Okay, that whole system's running at 35% efficiency and all of that goes away with a good DC microgrid, all of it. I've been wanting to do that for a while, right? Draw a picture of all this, I know it's a big crazy picture, but the wipeout is massive to run a power system to heat badly insulated houses. You notice the thick walls on our houses, the straw bale, it's all self-contained. And we're not talking about straw bale today, we're talking about DC microgrids. So that's how a power system works. And the modern solution is to just add so-called renewable energy to it, and it's not renewable. It's crazy. If you take uh, all of the, the carbon output from all of the photovoltaic panels produced to date, and they are net negative, uh, we have yet to make up for the amount of energy that's been burned to produce all of the photovoltaic panels on the planet. So if you think about taking, photovoltaic is somewhere around, I don't know, one or 2% of the current power grid. If you extrapolate that out, for decades of how long it would take to replace the current economy with photovoltaic panels, we would stay net negative for 70 years probably in terms of the amount of energy it takes to make photovoltaic panels versus powering the industrial economy with them. Um, it ain't gonna happen, it ain't gonna work. Um, and yet that is by far the dominant move, uh, uh, trend among mainstream environmentalists. So let's talk about um, a DC microgrid. I gave you some, uh, some uh, Hence, there, you know, how different systems integrated, uh, DC power, different voltages. Um, so let's talk about uh, doing work with, with motors. Um, uh, what happened historically was back in the 70s, 80s, when people first started doing uh, uh, off-grid houses, uh, they wanted to use all their appliances. This is still the big issue. So they wanted to use all of their appliances um, uh, wouldn't somebody mind grabbing that blender actually that wouldn't be a bad demonstration here um, the base too if you would uh, people wanted to use all their vacuum cleaners and blenders and washing machines da, da, da. so they built uh, what is now what it, what became the standard back then has since been the standard which is you get a big battery bank uh, lead acid batteries because you can't afford anything any better those things are crummy uh, they die in the average life expectancy is about five years sometimes you get a little more than that so yeah let's bring the blender up here so everybody wants to wonder blender. So they get the big battery bank, the big inverter. An inverter is something that takes AC, DC power and makes it an AC. Um, although inverters vary quite a bit. So true, uh, true uh, AC power looks like that. Um, and it's actually a back and forth pulse, although it's driven, drew, drawn as a sine curve. DC power looks like that. So an inverter that does that, takes this and makes it into that, it's actually kind of expensive. What most cheap inverters do is they generate something that looks like that. And it works for most devices, except it doesn't work for all of them, okay? Um, 
So just to be aware that cheap inverters, some machines, uh, like this, this is a standard straight up AC motor here. Now when it comes to motors, there are hundreds of different ways to build a motor. And I don't, I don't know all of those ways myself and uh, I certainly don't want to take up hours of time talking about it. But most AC motors, or a lot of AC motors, do not like this square wave stuff. They need the more expensive true sine wave stuff. So you end up, if you're going to build a household scale system, you're going to have thousands or even $10,000 in your inverter. They last about 15 years. You're looking at hundreds of dollars per year just to make that DC current into true sine wave so you can run your motor. So this is about a one-third horse motor. This is what would run a washing machine or uh, any household appliance about that size. Um, but you need the expensive inverter to do it. Um, so uh, what we did at Living Energy Farm uh, is we said, okay, well, what the heck? Why don't we try and run DC motors? Uh, now, DC motors are really cool, industrial motors. So we have different uh, kinds of DC motors up here. There are, like I said, hundreds of different ways to build a motor. Let's look at this one first, because this one actually shows you kind of how a motor works. Um, so everybody's done this experiment, right, where you get two magnets and you know you've got positive and negative, and you put the negative to positive and it draws together. You go positive to positive and it pushes apart. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, right? Well, this is a permanent magnet motor. It's got two big heavy iron magnets uh, right up here in the middle of it. Um, and then there's a part of the motor that spins. Um, and the spinning part of the motor has um, coils of wire stuck onto it, basically. Has anybody ever taken, I could have done this as a demonstration. You can take a nail, this will kill a battery really quickly. Just get a little nine volt battery or something like that. You connect the two wire, two ends of a wire to the, to the battery, wrap the wire around a nail, and it immediately magnifies, uh, turns the nail into a magnet. Have you all ever done that experiment? Well, that's an electromagnet. Uh, an electrical field going through a coil like that creates an electrical electromagnet. Um, so the way a DC motor works, an industrial DC motor. Um, woo. Okay, so there's your motor brush. Um, so the electricity comes back. It, uh, it is wired to hit the top part of the brush, those little metal tangs right there, those copper tangs. Travels down that little wire to this, and this is a conductive form of carbon of some sort. Um, and if you look inside, I don't know if y'all can see, y'all get up close where y'all can see it, right? You see those little bars spinning past? Okay, see them? If y'all can see it out there on camera or not, see little bars spinning past? Well, each bar is connected to a, a, a coil in here. And as the electricity is transmitted from that little tang down that wire to this carbon thing into that magnet, it's just like the wire around a nail, that's an electromagnet. And everything is spaced in there. So the permanent magnet, the electrical magnet, is just, it's not right there, it's just a little bit off. So they push each other away. And it happens really quickly that as this one's pushing it, uh, itself away, the next piece of the coil comes up and pushes it away, and that's your rotary motion. See how simple this is? These are really simple motors. Um, these were developed, I don't know when they were first invented, but certainly back in the 1800s they were making uh, DC brush motors. Uh, now that brush, uh, on a good quality motor, this is about as cheap a motor as you're going to find, and I'm not buying any more of this particular kind, although we do use a lot of cheap uh, motors manufactured overseas. Um, but these motors, this motor is, is similar to that one, you know, in terms of what the work it'll do. Um, motors are standardized in uh, electric motors at least, uh, 1800 or sometimes 1700 to 1800 RPM uh, or 3600. Those are kind of the two ranges. Now, not all of them fit it within that. But, uh, so this is a 1700 RPM, you know, like one third or one half horse motor, and that's the same thing. Any work that this AC motor will do, this DC motor will do it exactly the same way, more or less. There are some slight differences, but none that need concern you. Um, the one thing, now these brush motors are pretty cheap. The American manufacturers, uh, the two big brand names are like Baldor and Leeson. If you're going to go out and buy motors, you guys out there, you can get the cheap Chinese motors, and mostly okay. The Baldors and Leeson show up on, used a lot these days. Good quality industrial motors, which is nice uh, for cheap. You try to buy them new, they're deadly price-wise. These are cheap. Um, but this brush wears away. The rule of thumb is when that brush gets to be the same length as it is wide, you need to pull it out and put in a new brush. These brushes are dirt cheap. Uh, they're in standardized sizes more or less. Um, but if you really let this go too far, now that thing in there, the bars you saw going by, it's called a commutator. This little metal part will go down there and start chewing on the commutator. That's not good. Uh, so I have changed out brushes once on, at Living Energy Farm in 10 years. Uh, and that's, even with pretty heavy use, a decent quality, 
uh, DC brush motor will put up with several years at least of use before it needs a replacement brushes. Um, so it's not a lot of maintenance and you see how hard it is. You just slide that out, slide that in, screw it in. And there it is, you just replaced your brushes. Good to think about that though in terms of when you're building stuff to make sure you can get to your motors. Um, all right, so let's talk about doing work with motors. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of motors. Um, uh, and motors have different, uh, so these are little scooter motors. Um, unfortunately, they don't have a lot of information on them. Uh, this has like a tag that tells you all kind of useful stuff. Uh, but this is uh, a DC, uh, what's called a brushless motor. Um, and the way it works, instead of having that commutator back there in the brush, it's got some heavy transistors in here. What a transistor does is just an electronic switch. A computer these days uh, is like a bazillion tiny microscopic transistors. That's all it is. Uh, well, this has got big ones. Um, so it creates an electrical pulse going into those electromagnets inside the motor electronically rather than mechanically. Um, generally, if you've got a motor, like if you're building shop tools, washing machine, anything where you can get to it pretty easy, a brush motor like this is going to be cheaper. Uh, and you can get to it to replace the brushes, not so bad. If you're doing stuff like submersible pumps, uh, that's a pump that goes down in the bottom of the well, it's not easy to get to. Uh, you're probably going to want a brush, brushless motor. Uh, this is a long-term motor that can be repaired. This is a kind of use it and throw it away eventually motor, but these, these brushless motors were generally run for many, many years before they're worn out. And theoretically, you could still fix them. Uh, this is another brushless motor, and you really just have to look up get the information from the manufacturer to know what these motors are, what they'll do, what they're good for. Um, but in applications where you are uh, doing uh, yeah, stuff you can't get to, you want uh, brushless. Um, uh, other motors, uh, so this motor is really kind of heavy. Uh, this motor is really kind of heavy. This is a straight up AC motor. This is like a one third horse motor. Uh, if you ever use like a regular circular saw, you know how much horsepower they're good for? Two and a half or three horsepower. So a permanent magnet motor like this that would put out three horsepower, it would, be, uh, it would be about this big. It would cost several thousand dollars and it would weigh several hundred pounds. Um, the motors that uh, are in uh, little tools that you can carry around, and that's including cordless tools. Um, I don't know if y'all can see this. Did you see the sparks in there? You see them? Now you've got to get up close. I can see them. You can see them when it starts and stops. The sparks in there, well, that's the sparks coming off the brushes. Okay, this is a brush motor. This is a brush motor. This blender, I wish I could plug it in. If you turn this upside down and turn it on, you'd see sparks up in those heating vents. They're all brush motors. Okay, now this is a designated DC motor. This is actually a designated DC motor. These two motors are actually what are called universal motors. They're brush motors, and they're made in a very similar fashion to this, except they're really lightweight. This probably has twice the horsepower of that, the power, um, but weighs like 10% as much. Um, it's called a universal motor. Universal motors are very powerful and very lightweight. Anything that you can pick up and carry around your house is probably a universal motor. Now what happens in um, household electricity uh, there's two wires coming in off the pole. They're basically 120 volt, both of them. Sometimes they call that 110, and measured against each other, they're 240. But most of your household stuff is 120. Uh, most PV panels these days are in the 30 to 35 volt range. Remember talking about the VMP and all of that last week? So if you put three of them in series, uh, you would get uh, 90 volts. And what we have found uh, is that uh, these motors that are made to run at 120 volts AC are quite happy at 90 volts DC. You do have to use external switches. Um, but if you're going to get, uh, if you're going to run a motor, any motor, you need to come close to the voltage and you need to get close to the amperage. So if this motor is expecting 15 amps, um, what we have at LEF is six panels because this will give us 90 volts at 8 amps. We tie in the other three, these are in series. We put those in parallel, and then we get 90 volts at 16 amps. That's how we run our universal motors. Now, um, another thing to be aware of with motors, 
Um, let's start looking at the sticker on this motor. All right, so we got serial number. We got field, PM. What do we think PM means? Remember the magnets? The M is magnet. It means permanent magnet. They're just telling you what kind of motor it is. Permanent magnet. Okay. Armature, 180 volt. Okay. ARM, 180. So this motor we're going to run off of six panels in series. Okay. Uh, horsepower, one. So that's actually a good size motor. One. RPM, 1750. Everybody knows RPM stands for rounds per minute, right? RPM. 1750. That's some of them. Sometimes it's 1700, 1750, 1800. Those are all similar. Enclosure TEFC stands for totally enclosed fan cooled. Insulation class F. I don't even know what that means exactly. Um, model. That's just a manufacturer's model. Uh, amperage five amps. So we got 180 volt at five amps. Okay. That's sometimes that's just A. Sometimes they give you amps. Um, Okay, now where I was going here, duty, C-O-N-T. What do you think that means? Continuous. Continuous. Okay, now this, that's an important designation because most of these brush motors, so the people who made this angle grinder knew that you're going to grind with it for about 10 minutes and you're going to put it down and walk away with it. Two days later, you're going to come back and you're going to grind with it for 15 minutes and you're going to put it down and come walk away from it. Um, if you've got a motor running your heating system, remember the blowers on our house? They run eight hours a day, month after month after month. You would not want to take a brush motor like this and that's not made to run continuous and run eight hours a day. So if you're looking for something that's going to work like that, you need to look at the label, look at the identification stuff, and see is it made to run continuously. Um, frame, okay? That is sometimes just FR. Sometimes they spell it out F R M E. Sometimes they say NEMA M F F uh, NEMA F R or NEMA frame. NEMA stands for National Electrical Manufacturers Association. Frame. What the frame is telling you is um, the, the shape of the motor. Um, so if you're gonna, let's say you got a shop tool. You just went out and bought a compressor with a belt on it and it had this AC motor on it. Okay, now this, is this a brush motor? No, it's just a straight up AC motor. Can we run DC into it? No, not gonna work. Uh, this is a universal motor, that's a universal motor. These we can run on DC, okay? This straight up AC motor cannot handle DC. These straight up DC motors cannot handle AC. This motor cannot handle AC. So there's a lot of different kinds of motors. But let's say we got this motor in a machine and we wanna replace it. Okay, we're going to need to look at the nameplate. Now, this one has a plate right here. Uh, it's going to give you the horsepower. You got a little bit of flexibility in horsepower. Like, let's say this is a third horsepower, and you happen to have a half horsepower motor laying around. That's fine. That'll work. But if this were a one horsepower, and you tried to replace it with a half horsepower, that would be tough. Your motor might not want to do work very well. So you got a little bit of flexibility, but if you start stepping down a whole bunch, um, one nice thing about DC motors, um, AC motors need near perfect voltage and they need to run at a particular speed. So this um, has got to be a 1700 RPM motor, I'm sure. Let me see if I'm right. Let's see if it even tells us. Motor RPM, 1725. So these two motors have the exact same speed. But the difference is, let's say we overload this motor. We under voltage it, underpower it, and it's only turning 300 RPMs. Is that going to burn it up? Nah, it's fine. These, these motors, a big version of this motor, is what pulls freight trains. It's what pulls the massive mining equipment, those dump trucks that are big as a two-story house. They have these things. I mean, not this exact motor, of course, but a big honking DC motor in the wheel, like a freight, freight engine. It has, a, I think, 8,000 horsepower diesel engine in the front of the freight train, a big diesel generator bolted onto the back of the engine, and then big heavy cables coming down to a DC motor that's basically designed just like this stuck right in the wheel. The reason for that is because this motor can turn very slowly because it's just those magnets pushing on each other. It doesn't matter how fast it's going. Those magnets are still going to push. This motor can turn very slowly. 
It can tolerate huge voltage swing, huge power swing, and it's okay. This AC motor cannot. If you undervolt this AC motor, you'll burn up heat, you'll build up heat in the wiring and melt it. If you overload it and slow it down, you'll build up heat in that motor and melt it. It won't work. So the DC motors have a lot more flexibility. And we're running these straight off the panel. But if you're going to replace it, what you've got to look at. So what the NEMA frame tells you is where are these bolts, where's that shaft, what's the distance from the bolts to the shaft, and how big the shaft is. In other words, if you've got a 56-frame motor and you stick in a 56-frame uh, uh, DC motor, they will fit. Now, you notice how this motor's longer. 56 ain't telling you what's back here. It's telling you where the bolts are and where this is. Uh, but you can take any AC motor, and if you get the same speed, same horsepower, same frame, same NEMA frame number, and I'll tell you, the big NEMA frame numbers in all household motors are 48, 56, and 56C. Um, this one here is actually an A56, which I've never seen before. But anyway, I don't know exactly what that means. But uh, if you get those numbers, uh, uh, you know, if they're the same numbers, then that motor will do the same work. Um, okay? Um, Horsepower, uh, amperage, speed, frame. You can undershoot the, the voltage a bit. You can undershoot or overshoot the horsepower a little bit. You would not want to put, so the high speed motors, like the 3600 RPM motors, those are almost all pumps, it, both air and water. Uh, pumps these days, most of them are centrifugal. Uh, so the inside of a pump uh, just has this snail shell thing that looks like this. Um, and it just, so what happens is the air or sometimes the, the liquid usually, but sometimes the air comes in right in the middle of the pump and it just flings it really quick going out and throws it out. This took centuries for people to figure this out, but that has to spin really fast to work. Uh, so things that like pumps or that have those 3600 RPM motors, they're not going to work with a 1700 RPM motor. You can't, you're not going to swap those over. This will work. You know, if you're running at 36, eh, it's okay at 34, okay, it's okay at 3,000, but you drop it down to like 1,500, it'll just quit working completely. Um, is that in the same direct couple as the other type of system you're talking about? That is a big issue, actually. So this is a perfect example. In fact, this is not even direct coupled. So back in the old days, most things were belt drive. Um, and that makes life easier for those of us trying to do DC. Um, so let's say you get an old-fashioned bench grinder. It's got your AC motor. This, that's your motor. That's your pulley. Here's the pulley on the bench grinder. And there's your grinder wheel. And there's a belt that goes around like that, right? It's a straight proportion. If this is a one-inch pulley and that's a two-inch pulley, it's a, it's a you know, uh, one-half reduction. It's super easy to figure out. Most things these days, a lot of shop tools, a lot of equipment, they just figured out how to make it cheaper by turning that around and bolting it right onto the face of the motor. And unfortunately, the whole NEMA thing breaks down. There's not a real good standardized way of describing that direct coupling method. So for instance, right now, you know, we are promoting DC equipment because you can, you know, the environmental benefits are huge, uh, but we're limited. Oh, I should have brought that little DC fan. So we just brought in a new DC fan from a company in Asia. Uh, that has, you know, a nice brushless motor on it, sort of run for years and years and years. Um, uh, why was I talking about that? But in any case, so the, the direct couple, when things bolt onto the face of the motor, that, that's not covered in your NEMA frame system. Uh, so if you buy like a brand new compressor washing machine, that's where I was going with that. So we don't have a good washing machine. We get, the one we have is a cement mixer. We use it, but other people don't want that. Um, but all the washing machines now direct coupled so that there's a, a little transmission power conversion device bolted right on, it's just bolted right onto the face of the motor. And you'll notice this motor has the bolt holes right there. This is a 56C, I think, right? Yeah, it's a frame, 56C, yeah. Everything we have is 56C almost. So that also describes this bolt pattern here. So in theory, you can direct couple onto this motor, um, but it's, it's not, it gets a lot more difficult with direct coupling. So what works better, if you can find it, is to go back and find belt drive compressors, belt drive grinders, uh, belt drive drill press, belt drive, whatever you can find. And then it's super easy. You just put pulleys on there and you can even adjust the pulleys. If you happen to have a 3600 RPM motor, you can just put bigger and smaller pulleys and slow it down with the pulleys. Uh, that works fine. Um, 
but yeah, the direct coupling thing is, is really complicated things. Um, although there are the external direct coupling, it's an old fashioned method of direct coupling where there's actually an independent shaft out here. Lovejoy was the big company. What a funny hippie name for industrial equipment, but it's just a, a, a prong coupling that goes together. Those are easy enough to swap out, but if it's bolted right onto the face of the motor, that's more difficult. All right. So we can do most of what anybody can do with DC, AC, we can do with DC. Um, uh, if you, you know, do the math, do your conversions. Um, are you going to be able to see me if I sit down? Let's check it. Camera check, quick. All right. So. Again, I'm not teaching you how to be an electrician. You're not going to walk away from today's lesson uh, understanding how to wire a whole house by yourself. But uh, I am going to try to tell you some about wiring. Um, so I mentioned last week, I think, that below 48 volts is considered mostly safe. Above 48 volts is considered hazardous. Um, I also mentioned last week that the thing that generates heat in wires is the amperage, right? Um, now, uh, in normal household wiring, uh, uh, most of it's put together with wire nuts. This is a wire nut. You notice these guys come in different sizes. There's a little orange one and yellow one, and red one. Uh, they're made for different sizes of wiring. And if you get a box of wire nuts, we will give you a little chart. Um, wire is measured by gauge. Um, let's see where I put my wire strippers. I lost my wire strippers. There they are. So this is just my random box of wire out of the shop. I keep this around for scrap. So different wire is made in different gauges, different sizes. And this little chart tells you which sizes these wire nuts are good for. Um, uh, so in household wiring code, I don't know if I even have an NM cable here. I don't. Um, so this wire, if you're running electricity through it, any wire, it's just a wire. It's not as likely to have trouble. But when we connect two wires together, um, we increase the likelihood of something bad happening in the future. Um, when we put these together, uh, if there's going to be a problem, it's usually going to be at the joint uh, between two wires. right? So now this is a bare wire, uninsulated. But the way building code works um, is that any time there's a joint, any time there's a connection, it has to be inside of a box. So when we're in a building like this. You can see the light fixtures. You've got boxes over here, boxes over here. There's wires going through conduits, wires going through the wall. Nowhere in any building, anywhere where electrical code applies, is there a wire nut or an electrical, connector out, an electrical connection outside of a box. The reason for that, and this is really important, is because it can happen. It certainly can happen. They, this just doesn't get put on right. Or over time, you get some oxidation between those two wires. Um, and then somebody starts drawing a lot of amps through it. The amps is what generates heat. Um, if there's going to be a problem, there's a 99% chance. Let's say we're overloading these wires. We're drawing too much electricity from them. There's a 99% chance that the heat is going to build up here and not just in the wire. Okay. So it's really important that all your connections are enclosed. With the high voltage DC that we run, it's lethal, potentially. We run 180 volt. That could kill you. Um, personally, well, uh, there are differences with AC. Um, but you want to stick to code if you don't understand code. You want good connectors, and you want them inside of a box. The other thing that I've seen people do, I've seen like rednecks do this with their old, they got their old 57 Chevy out back, um, and they don't have any connectors. I don't have any connectors. So they'll take these two wires and they'll twist them together like that and then wrap some electrical tape over them. Well, that'll work for a few months. You know, the lights on your car will keep working and a few months from then it'll quit. Well, okay, it's annoying if it quits. But if you start doing that with your DC wiring, you know, with just tape on that, it'll generate a lot of heat. One of the downsides of DC versus AC is that across a, cor a corroded connection, when DC starts to bridge a gap, so when you get a little bit of corrosion in there, basically it's almost as if you pull the wires apart a little bit and that electricity is having to jump over that gap, DC generates more heat than AC. Uh, you do not want bad connections in DC wiring. 
Um, wire nuts are fine, but you want wire nuts and you want them inside of a box. Um, for the solar kits that we sell, um, I lost them in my shirt. We use crimp connectors. I don't have them here. Uh, those are used a lot in automotive, uh, but they go on the end of the wire and they crimp it together tight. Again, it's not, the problem with just twisting to get wires together like that is there's no compression. There's nothing holding them together tight. Uh, this is a another kind of connector that's used for bigger wires. It's called a split bolt. But again, it's a tight compression fitting. Uh, you can go to the electrical store and get all kind of lug connectors and whatever. Whatever's going on, those wires need to be stuck together tight. Now, in terms of figuring out the size of wiring and how you're going to wire things, um, it gets to be complicated, but I'll tell you the household numbers that every electrician has in the back of their head is that a 14-gauge circuit will handle 15 amps, 12-gauge will handle 20 amps, 10-gauge will handle 30 amps. And because, if you just happen to have those numbers in your head, and because we're doing the high voltage thing, the 180 volt thing around here, we don't have anything on the farm bigger than 10 gauge. Back in the old days, remember I was talking about the 1970s, when people started trying to do DC systems, because it did make sense. What they do is they get a tw 12 or 24 volt you know, motor and try to run that, except you remember voltage and amperage trade off against each other. So if you're trying to make a, a half a horsepower, at 12 volts, you gotta have a whole pile of amps and then you end up with a big expensive wire and then if you get any loose connection, you get all kinds of heat. Big messy deal. Um, so the wiring that's in the wall of most houses, and again, if you're gonna do this on a big scale, go talk to an electrician, but I'm gonna show you the basic idea. Um, so the, the lamp cord and stuff like this, this is stereo speaker wire lamp cord. That's fine for a lamp, it's fine for, you know, we use it for low voltage, like short runs lighting. Do not put this stuff in a wall. Uh, it does not have the grade of insulation. Uh, the, the way wires are identified, there's a bunch of different three or four letter codes. Um, uh, so most of what's in most walls is, is uh, NMB, which most electricians just call Romex. Okay, that has a heavier insulation jacket on it. Uh, NM stands for non-metallic B. Um, UF stands for underground feeder. Okay, uh, USE, underground service. So all of these different wires have different degrees of, of how, how tough they are. So when you're going to run your wiring around your farm, you need real wires. You can't just go picking up this stuff and pulling it through your conduits, pulling in the walls, don't do it that way. Uh, some of these, the USC and the UF, uh, the plastic that's around the wire actually has uh, UV resistant. So it can tolerate being out in the sun at least a little bit. And when you go to strip it out, pull the insulation off of there, you'll notice it's much, much tougher insulation. Um, oh, the other kind of wiring. Extension cord wiring, that's called SO or SOJ, S double O J. I don't even know what those letters stand for. We just discovered a new kind of wiring that we've discovered for uh, hooking up outdoor solar panels, which is SL or SL2. And I don't know what that means either. Uh, but that's a less expensive outdoor rated wire. Um, so the rule with motors is if it, DC motors, if it doesn't say it's brushless, that means it has a brush because brushless is more expensive. The rule with wires is if it doesn't say it's outdoor rated, it's not. Uh, the absence of that word implies that it's only indoor. The absence of the word brushless implies that it's a brush motor. Um, all right. Should have brought my clients in here. Any questions while I think about what to talk about next? What's that? Huh? Okay, we're good. All right, so in terms of figuring out wire sizes, somebody who's worked with wiring for a while, uh, you can look at that. I can look at that and tell you it's a number 12. Um, if you haven't done it that way before, you can actually use your wire uh, stripper. It's got numbers going out on the gauge there. You start with your big gauge, try to strip it. Oh, that's stripped out at number 10. Oh, it's actually, oh, see, it doesn't want to go through the number 12. 
Oh, see, that's a number tw uh, 10 wire. It just barely fits in there, right? So if it's a number 10, it's good for what? 30 amps, right? So you can go back and do the math and figure out what that'll work for. Um, I may have not prepared enough to have an hour's worth of stuff to talk about here. Huh? Sure. Sure. No, that's fine. Let's talk about motors. Um, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I do know that like a 1700 RPM AC motor, if you pull it down, like you slow it way down, it starts to heat up really quickly and it will burn it out. You know, it, I don't actually understand very well all the ways different, I have sort of an intuitive understanding of motors in general, but I don't really know. Um, I don't, I don't. I mean, if you take a table saw or an industrial machine with an AC motor in it and you overload it, it heats up very quickly. You will destroy the motor in two or three minutes. Um, with a DC motor, you slow it down, it's fine. It's totally fine. It's just a different design. It's a you know, different internal structure in the motor as to why DC can handle the overloading, can handle the differences in speed. Um, and even with an AC and DC, there's just so, if you go online and just type in, you know, DIY motor, you'll get all these funky little weird ways to make a motor in terms of taking electricity and making rotary power out of it. Um, the question was, why do, uh, why do DC motors tolerate variable speed so much better than AC? Now, these days, they do have computerized AC motors. What they used to do back in the old days um, if they needed, so back in the old days, if you wanted a particular, something just was going to run at a particular speed, you used an AC motor. If you had something that you wanted to have a variable speed on, they would use a DC motor. Like any of the old shop equipment that dates back to the 1940s, 50s, 60s has a DC motor on it. They put an AC-DC converter on there um, and uh, convert it to DC and then run a DC motor because then you can just vary the voltage and, and vary the motor. Um, the... Uh, Conversion from AC to AC voltage is really easy. It's just two coils wrapped around each other. That's called a transformer. Uh, conversion from AC to DC is really easy. They use something called a rectifier or rectifier diode, or there's, there's a few different kinds of rectifiers. Uh, but you know, so AC is a pulse that goes like that. A diode is something that allows electricity to travel in one direction and blocks it coming back in the other direction. They use a lot in electronics. But if you get a big rectifier and put it in an AC wire, um, it'll let half the AC go through and stop the other half, and it effectively converts AC into DC. So it's really cheap and easy to go from AC to DC. It is not cheap and easy to go from DC back to AC because you have to have a pretty fancy circuit to create that curve. And again, a cheap, cheap curve is a square curve, and an expensive curve is a sine wave curve, a true sine wave curve. Um, They, get, they use an electromagnet. What, so the question is, why are the universal motors so much uh, lighter than the, the DC motors? Uh, the main difference is that instead of having a big, heavy hunk of iron as a permanent magnet, they use two electromagnets. An electromagnet can be a tiny little coil of wire and generate a very powerful magnetic field, whereas a permanent magnet has to be this huge chunk of iron. That's the main difference. Um, but yeah, they're very powerful and lightweight. Most, most, so our, the question is about universal motors and continuous use. Yeah, if you turn, so this motor, if you turned it on and let it run 24-7, uh, you would need to change the brushes about once every two or three years. Um, and if you change the brushes every two or three years, it will last for decades. Eventually, you could open the motor up. What will happen is the commutator will start to get pitted, chewed up a little bit. You can, you can, that's that little, the little bars inside, that's the commutator. So the brushes, the brush is much softer than the commutator, so the brush wears away, and the sparks you see are the little chips of the brush coming off. Uh, but over time, that commutator will get a little damaged. You can actually pull the commutator out of there and put it in a lathe and fix it. That's an old-fashioned skill. Um, uh, whereas if you took this blender and you turned it on and let it run 24-7, it would burn out in a matter of days. It would not last for years. It's not made to be a continuous motor, number one. so. Where this starts to come into play is, unfortunately, you know, we're promoting DC equipment, but there's not a lot 
You have to be careful. Like I was saying, any motor that doesn't say brushless is a brush motor. So let's say you want a little fan. Well, the only fan on the market that's not even on the market yet is the one you, we just brought in that's brushless. But there's a bunch of truckers' fans. So you got all these guys driving these trucks around, and they want a fan in the cab of their truck. Well, you, there's a, there's a half a dozen different companies making those. None of them identify whether it's a brush motor or a brushless motor. Um, my experience with small brushless motors, and this includes small pumps, small fans, they're just not that well made. What happens is as the brush runs in there and runs out, the commutator gets destroyed. They're good for two or three years, and then they're done. They're trash. Um, you just can't fix them. That's what I've seen on most of them, uh, which is the reason we wanted to bring in a brushless fan to have something that might last 10 or 20 years instead of two or three. Um, As long as you, so the question is reliability as it relates to universal motors. Anything that's being used intermittently has just got a lot less wear and tear on it. So any blender, circular saw, angle grinder, vacuum. You know, you don't run a vacuum, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week. Maybe you did if you worked for some company. But you know, those motors are made to run, stop, run, stop, run, stop. They're just not made to run all day long every day. Whereas these motors are made to run all day long every day, but they're big heavy things. You know, this is not a vacuum cleaner motor. This is a big, heavy thing. Uh, but it, it, it has bearings in it that are durable. It has, you know, it's just better made. Even, even a cheap Chinese crappy mo uh, motor like this is still a lot more durable than one of these. Now, these are also made for continuous duty. Um, so they've got good bearings in them. Uh, a good brushless motor will run for decades. Uh, the pumps, the three big pump companies are Grunfos, Lorentz, and Sun Pumps. Well, there's a few others, actually, but those are the three biggest uh, that make the submersible pumps. And those, you know, you get, you get 20 or 30 years out of them if you're not running them all that much. But those are brushless, uh, uh, continuous-duty motors. Are there anything in the spec you can look on in the spec for the motor? So, like, there might be red flags, but maybe it's not a spin motor? Or Definitely. There's... Um, the, the big thing, of course, is the, the, the duty rating. Is it continuous? Is it not? And this applies not only to, uh, to motors. Like, I just bought a DC compressor recently, right? Uh, the duty rating, so there, there's different ways that it's expressed. There's duty, duty rating um, or just duty. Um, those are slightly different, maybe. Uh, but, like, if you go to a hardware store, like, a lot of people have these little compressors that they, a roadside emergency compressor. Like it plugs into your cigarette lighter, you can pump up the tires on your car. But look at the duty rating on that thing. It's usually going to be expressed as a percentage, 25%, 50%, 75%. Um, what that means is that if you run it, let's say you get one that's rated at, at 25%, that means you can run it for 15 minutes out of an hour, and if you try to run it for 30 minutes, it's going to melt. Um, and a lot of those cheap little DC appliances have very low duty rating. Uh, I just bought a DC compressor because we sent this trip to Arizona to go install solar kits in the Navajo and Hopi, and we had vehicles with bad tires, so it was cheaper to buy a compressor than a whole new set of tires. And I looked around and found a, a commercial compressor unit that was made to go in like trucks, to run the air system on trucks, 100% duty rating. So if you find something with a 100% duty rating, that's very different than something with a 50% duty rating. Um, the other... Uh, thing that you'll see on the electrical motors is what's SF, uh, or surface, service factor. And that is a, a code system that I don't actually understand very well, except that a higher number is better. <laughs> I don't even know what the range of the numbers is, though. Um, so, but they do, they do have different ratings. You could compare service factor, but that's only going to be in industrial motors. Um, and again, if you have something that gives you no duty rating, Let's say you're looking at a, hard, a compressor in the hardware store and they're not telling you to duty rating, that's because it ain't got it, it's shit. Uh, if they don't tell you whether or not it's brushless, it's got brushes. If they don't tell you whether or not it's got a duty rating, it has a bad one. Um, like you're buying some little trucker's fan or a truck stop, no duty rating, no service factor. It's just a junky little motor. I mean, if it's cheap and you want to buy it, that's fine. But any industrial equipment, any equipment that's made to last for a long time is going to give you that information. Uh, the factor on this one is 1.3. I think it goes, I don't think it only goes up to like two or something, that the service factor rating. I don't remember those numbers, I should. But in any case, uh, higher numbers are better. <laughs> uh, 
and certainly for duty rating, it's a percentage, so you know 100% is what you want for the most part, <coughs> unless you can't get it. That it, is it the magnets yeah, in a motor? It's well, it's the two magnets pushing against each yeah. other. Yes. Yeah. It's, an it's an, either two electromagnets pushing against each other mm -hmm. or a, an electromagnet pushing against a uh, permanent magnet. But they, they move the magnets all around, and the number of coils and the position of the magnets and how the electricity flows through there, there's literally hundreds of different ways to make a motor. I mean, interestingly enough, when you look at a three-phase industrial motor, which just means it has sort of three points of, of reaction in it. It's, there's no difference between a motor and a generator. Uh, what a motor is, is when you put electricity into those three points, and three phase is like three, three AC curves that are made to complement each other, so that the, the timing of the curves is such that they create this more powerful flow, and even that, they've got like a bunch of different ways of doing that. But in any case, uh, if you take a three phase AC motor, uh, and you put electricity into it, it makes the motor spin. And then if you put an me external mechanical power source and you speed it up, it starts pushing electricity back out the wire and it becomes a generator. All you did was speed it up. I saw that with big industrial systems in Virginia. I tried to help some, help some friends build a, uh, a uh, water uh, hydro turbine setup years ago. And the, the low budget way to do hydropower is to get a three phase industrial motor hook it up to a turbine, and then just spin it, and it makes electricity. Uh, you can hook it up to the AC wires coming in off the grid, and it'll push the power backwards, uh, back into the grid. Now, you're supposed to have a bunch of safety equipment on there. You can't be pushing power back into the grid without the power company knowing about it, or they will get very grumpy. Um, I mean, there's a reason for that. It's the transformer, the step-down transformer that brings the electricity into your house. What happened, the, the line people, people who work on the lines get killed from this. You get some construction guy who's got his own construction company, he's got his own generator, and there's a big thunderstorm, and the power goes out. Well, he goes and hooks his construction generator to his equipment in his house, not realizing that he's still connected back to the grid. So that little bit of electricity in his house goes out. The, the distribution lines are like 7,000 volts, so they're not like the 500,000 volt lines, but still, 7,000 volts is a bunch. Well, that little bit of electricity coming out of that generator hits that transformer. A transformer is just two coils like this. The electricity goes through that way or the other way, it doesn't matter. So that 120 volts coming out of his transformer hits that transformer, jumps up to 7,000 and kills somebody up the road. Uh, that happens, and that's part of the reason the power company is so very grumpy about people tying into their wires. Because uh, those transformers, they, they go up, they go down. You tie something in there, when they don't know you're doing it, you could hurt, their, hurt people. Um, so you can't, if you're gonna be off grid, fine. If you're gonna be on grid, fine. But you, you get into that gray area where you're trying, I've known some people who like tried to do their own unauthorized off-grid grid tie systems not such a good idea I mean first of all the power company will notice and come say bad things to you but it's also a big safety issue for them uh, for us the safety issues are uh, what I tell people when you're wiring new buildings is you either know how to new, uh, know how to do AC wiring or you need to hire somebody who does and if you're hiring an electrician let's just say you're gonna build a shop and you're going to run, want to run it on daylight drive DC, just like we have at Living Energy Farm, uh, and you've got the money to hire some guy, and he comes in, and you start talking about DC, and he starts to look confused, say, don't worry about DC. It's AC. Just tell him it's AC. Because high-voltage AC is wired exactly like high-voltage DC, for the most part. There's no difference. I mean, it, it's, it would always be desirable to solder the wires, but you don't have to. If you've got an electrician who's competent and make it about making tight connections with wire connectors, twisting the wires together, that's fine. Um, so there's no difference. Um, the only difference between high voltage DC and high voltage AC, or one big difference in the code, is grounding. Um, so what happens with any electrical circuit is there has to be um, there has to be a circuit for something to work, right? So if you got your motor um, here, and this is true for AC or DC, it's true for anything electrical. You've got a wire coming to it. Well, that doesn't nothing happens. You could have two wires. So the electricity can spin around the motor and go back on the second wire. Uh, if you break one of those wires, it quits. Um, well, with high voltage, uh, you know, you've got all kind of windings inside this AC motor. Over time, something bad could happen. One of your wires could get loose and touch the frame of the motor. Well, then the whole motor is electrified, and if you touch it, you get shocked. So what grounding does is it creates a second path 
there that's tied to the outside. It, the, all the metal boxes are grounded, all the conduits grounded, the metal pipe, the outside of the motor is grounded. Everything that somebody might touch has a ground wire connected to it. Now, interestingly enough, the ground wire and the neutral connect back at the panel board. So the electricity is coming out here, it's going back here, uh, and this ground wire under normal use never does anything. But if for some reason this got broken and this connected to the motor case, your ground wire would provide a safety to keep you from getting electrocuted. I've been electrocuted by a trailer that was not grounded. <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah, lots of us have gotten shot. <laughs> With low voltage DC, you don't need a ground. And that's in the code. The code says straight up, low voltage is not grounded. Now, if you're going to do PV panels, um, uh, talk about grounds a little bit. Grounding is a very complicated subject. It's complicated for me enough for me to say that it's way beyond what I understand, except, so if you got your house and you're going to put your PV panels up on the roof, you want a ground wire tied, connected to the metal frame of the panel, going down to the ground, okay? So if you take a lightning strike, <laughs> hits that panel, hopefully most of that electricity is going to go down that wire to the ground. Um, another thing that's important, um, can we do a little camera action there? So one of the disadvantages, there's a big advantage in our AC, our DC microgrid, and it, like I said, it's actually eight systems. So we've got, you know, the high voltage system that does most of the work. We've got the, all the little solar hot water systems. We've got the low voltage system for the lighting, another low voltage system for the fridge. Well, one of the disadvantages of that, it's a minor disadvantage, is surge arresters. So, um, so you want your external, the external metal frame of your PV panel wants to be grounded, but then inside the electrical boxes, you want to put something called a surge arrestor. And if we can swing the camera over here, see this little blue guy here? That is a surge arrestor. And in fact, if you have eight circuits, we don't have eight surge arresters because we don't put surge arrest, like the hot water pumps, it's just a little hot water pump. We're not going to protect that. But all the big stuff, the fridge has its own surge arrestor. The battery charge controller setup has its own surge arrestor. The high voltage system has its own surge arrestor. There are different companies that make different surge arresters. This is Midnight Solar here. This is one of the high quality ones. But we've got cheaper ones that we have in some other locations. So if you do get a surge coming in on the panel, uh, the surge will try to come down these wires and the surge arrestor is a gizmo that's in the circuit. It connects to both the hot wire and the neutral wire and to the ground. It, it senses this, what a surge is, is a high voltage pulse uh, created by uh, electrical activity in a, in a storm usually. That surge arrestor tries to catch that pulse and send it to the ground before it can get to your equipment and damage it. Um, they are not foolproof, they are not um, they're not foolproof, but they help a lot. Um, you will reduce your lightning damage quite a bit uh, if you use surge arresters. Um, so, so particularly if you live in an area with lots of thunder and lightning, you want those. Um, Can you catch what was different about grounding AC versus DC? Well, it, it's the voltage. It's not AC versus DC. So above 48 volts, everything needs to be grounded. Below 48 volts, doesn't matter. I mean, if there's ground wire there, it doesn't do any harm. But the ground is a, is a safety circuit. So like car automotive systems are not grounded. It's just 12 volts. 12 volts is not going to hurt you. So there's no, no need to ground it. If it happens to be grounded, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, but the point is that you know 90 volt DC or 180 volt DC or 120 volt AC or 120 volt uh, 240 volt AC, any of those can kill you. Uh, so uh, you know if your washing machine, washing machines, the old washing machines are pretty bad because there's water all over the place. So you get some wire that shakes loose and touches the side of the washing machine. Well, that ground is what keeps you from getting shocked, and that's equally true for high voltage AC or DC. Doesn't matter, AC or DC, it needs to be grounded, and code says that. Um, and as far as the electrical, what kind of wire you're using, uh, you know, all the code ramifications, it, it's not exactly the same, but for practical purposes, it is. If you wire to AC standards, you're fine for DC standards, anything below 600 volts. If you're gonna go above 600 volts, and I don't know why you would do that, that, so all the normal household wiring, the NMB, the THHN, US, USC, USF, uh, UF, all of that is generally rated to 600 volts, but you'd have no reason to ever go that high. That would be crazy. Although they are doing some of the off-grid systems, the grid tie systems now, they're running up, I think, at 360. Um, yeah, so I thought you said something about how, like, you could tell the electrician that there's zero DC and they're doing high voltage AC except for the grounding. No, no, except for the grounding with low voltage. 
Um, so the question is, you know, if, if you're just asking an electrician to do the wiring for you and they don't understand DC, you can just tell them it's AC and that will be fine. You do have to make sure the wire sizing is appropriate. Um, particularly like with our system. So there's also um, a load factor with wiring. So the numbers I gave you, the 14 gauge, uh, 15 amp, 12 gauge, 20 amp, uh, 10 gauge, 30 amp, that is not a 100% ser service factor rating. In fact, I think it's generally 80% is what they assume. In other words, if you've got a circuit that's gonna run 15 amps 24 seven, that's not a 14 gauge wire, that's a 12 gauge wire, you, go, you bump up one. So those amperages are not that's, that's uh, assumed to be a variable load, and that's your peak load, not your continuous load. Uh, and that matters for us because, so we've got our, our six panels in series at eight amps, uh, and that's okay on a 14 gauge wire, a tiny little wire. Three and three makes uh, uh, 90 volts at 16 amps, that's a 12 gauge wire at least. Um, so that's the one thing, because electricians are gonna assume that um, you know everything is, is household standards, they might not understand that you're gonna be doing things differently. But a lot of electricians, well anyway, you don't wanna be figuring out wire sizing without some help if you don't understand these things. Because, so um, the wire sizing business, when they get to doing like factories and big industrial things, um, there's a lot of science that goes into wire sizing. So wire that's independent like this by itself will actually carry more electricity than two wires stuck together like this. Because a lot of what determines what, how much current, how much amperage that wire will carry is how much air is around it. So they get into calculations, are, they, are the wires hanging in free air? Are they inside of a conduit? Are they wrapped in a plastic sheath? All of that affects how much current those wires can sustain. Because wires out in the free air are gonna dissipate heat more quickly, they can actually carry more electricity. As soon as you put them in a conduit, you've reduced it. If you put them inside of a plastic sheath, you've reduced it further. So the, um, so the wire size, calc and it's also strongly based on distance. Um, uh, so again, one of the things that got people in trouble back in the 70s and 80s is, is they tried to do everything low voltage. Nobody ever had the idea back in 1980 that you could run DC equipment, like solar equipment at you know, 90 or 180 volts like we're doing now. So when they were running these big motors, um, the voltage drop is really wicked at low voltage. So if you just compare 120 volt AC versus 12 volt DC, that's a 10 times difference in voltage, and it's AC and DC as well. But that means in order to have equivalent power, you'd have to have a 10 times increase in amperage. So if you had a, a one horsepower motor at the end of a 100 foot wire, uh, okay, you can do that with 90 or 180 volts. You don't wanna try to do that with 12 volts. Just don't even think about it with 24 volts. Don't even go there. Um, and this is part of the reason when we start talking to people, we're like going on public forums, and ah, you can't do that with DC. It's because of that history of trying to use low voltage DC to run motors. Bad idea. You end up either having big wires or having connections that melt and all kind of crazy stuff. Um, we've been running 180 volt for 10 years now, on, and it's great. Uh, it's, you know, you can use normal sized wiring. Um, I have noticed like the screws on some of our extension cords, if you don't clamp that screw down, it will heat up, uh, particularly if you're running heavy continuous loads, like we're cooking now. Um, if, you, if you grab, if you go to unplug your extension cord and you notice that plug is hot, the reason for that is because the screw inside that extension cord got a little bit loose. It's, it's clamping this uh, braided wire inside the extension cord and you're getting some heat buildup. You need to unplug it, take it apart, see how much is melted. If it's bad, cut it off, throw it away it just loosened up a little bit, tighten it down hard, put it back together. But that's where the heat comes from, the stuff getting loose. Um, more questions? No, go ahead. question is where does our extra electricity go on a PV system when it's not being used? It doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there and the wires hanging out. Um, that's the reason those panels have a VOC rating and a VMP rating. Uh, it's telling you precisely that, that the VOC is voltage open circuit. So if you have an open circuit, meaning you're not using your electricity, it'll push the voltage up. And the electricity just sitting there, it's not going anywhere. And then when you load it down, it's gonna go back down. 
But if for some reason you're stringing a bunch of stuff together and you're pushing the voltage up, you'd have to pay attention to like your peak VOC because it does push it up. It pushes it up quite a bit when you're not using it. I mean, the, the physics of exactly back. what's going on is a, is a little bit beyond me. I mean, electricity has electrons flowing, and where do they go when they're not flowing, and where do they all come from, and how do they all find their way home? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little beyond me. But I can tell you that when you're not using the photovoltaic electricity, it is just sitting there going nowhere in particular. Now, what charge controllers do, um, if you notice, like we use some of the... Uh, the Xantrex C series, that's the C35, C40, C60. They're the old tried and true, it's called pulse width modulation uh, charge controllers. They actually have a heating coil on top, a little, a little fins, because okay, so they're bringing in the power to the batteries, and what they do is when the batteries are drained down, when they first start charging the batteries, they dump a bunch of electricity into the batteries. And as the batteries start to fill up, they have electronics and they say, okay, battery's getting full, and they start taking some of that electricity and putting it into the heating fins and, and just dissipating it as heat, make it go away. And as the battery gets almost full, they want to take a, a you've got a bunch of electricity coming in from your PV panels, hits that charge controller, it wants to put a little bit into the battery, and then it just burns off the rest as heat. Um, the sad thing, and this is something, you know, it's really heartbreaking at this point to realize what's going on with renewable energy because there's such a huge across the board vested interest in believing in the viability of the windmills and the solar panels. Um, so I, I drew you that whole monster picture of, of the grid. And that is the grid, you know, it's coast to coast, all of North America is, is one big grid. So you th they ha it's these days, of course, there's a lot of computer technology involved, but they have to manage that thing very carefully. And in particular, you know, there's a lot of equipment out there. And when there's an equipment failure, they have to make sure. So what used to happen when they first started building grids is what's called a cascade. Um, so one thing, I don't, didn't I talk about this last week, but anytime you've got any electrical system, you need to have breakers and, and fuses to keep from overheating your wires. A breaker is just a switch that opens, like it senses too much amperage trying to go through, starts to build up heat, and the breaker just opens and, and cuts off that circuit. A fuse is just usually a piece of metal that just melts. So if this is a 30 amp wire, you put a 30 amp fuse on it, so when you get to 32 amps, the fuse melts instead of melting your wire. And it's a cheap little fuse to throw it away and replace it. Well, you take that out to the grid scale, um, and they have monster big circuit breakers and redundant systems. Because what's gonna happen is some squirrel in Tennessee is gonna find a, a, an acorn stuck between two high voltage wires in the substation, is gonna go in there Oh, it happens. It happens. They're particular, like the, the guys who work on the poles, you know, they're stringing wires around, and there's like one particular pole that's just in a high squirrel traffic area, and the wires are just such, and like once every six months, a squirrel goes in there, squirrel gets exploded, and the wire, it goes out, and they've got to go fix it. Um, but what that means is, for the grid, is you have to have redundancy. You have to have a lot of extra capacity, a lot of extra wires. So a cascade is when... Let's say your system is loaded. It's a summer afternoon, everybody's running their air conditioners, everybody's pulling heavy loads, and a squirrel, and a poor unfortunate little squirrel hits this substation right here and drops that wire. Well, what happens to this wire over here? The load from here shifts to there, and that system starts to overload. Well, those breakers get overloaded and they pop out, and that gets overloaded and that pops out. I don't know the history of it all that well, but there have been some famous cascades dating back to the 70s and 80s when like the whole East Coast just went out. You know, a squirrel in New York City gets baked and the whole East Coast just goes out one breaker at a time. Boom, 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 and it all falls down. Okay, so when I went out to Arizona in 2019 in April to do the, uh, to do the solar install in the Navajo Nation, um, when, you drive, when you go across the high plains in Upper Texas, I drove from sunup to sunset literally. I was driving in the dark in, in the morning and I was driving in the dark in the evening that day. That whole day I was driving past industrial windmills Every mile of the road was, had industrial windmills. That's what the High Plains is now. Except on that particular day, they were all sitting still. One or two of them might have just nudged a little bit, but they were all sitting still. So, I mean, it's sad that... So first of all, you know, the microgrid we have at DC means all that industrial power is unnecessary. And you're talking about billions of dollars 
trillions maybe at this point, massive investment. And you have to have a power grid that's big enough to tolerate all of those windmills sitting still and not cascade when some poor unfortunate squirrel does something stupid. You, you, you see the level of redundancy we're talking about? It's massive. It's huge. It's, it's, sort of, it's incomprehensible, really. And it's unnecessary. That's the kicker. It's completely unnecessary. But nobody makes money off of what we're doing, right? All the environmental liberals want those windmills. The conservatives fought them for a while, but then they realized, wait a minute. This is a centralized power system. We keep our coal plants. We keep our nuclear plants. We keep our frack gas. We keep the power lines. We keep the, the pipelines. We keep the roads. We keep all that. And then we add industrial fields, which, by the way, don't produce anything sometimes. It's just a huge another level of hardware. Um, uh, and so what happens with those windmills, with wind in particular, so, with, you know, the sun's going to come up every day. You know that. So the guys... You know, they're sitting there controlling these plants. It takes eight hours to heat up a coal plant. Uh, they do not cool those things off and heat them right back up. They have what are called peaking plants, which are plants that can come on like within 30 seconds. It's part of the protection for, against the cascade. So, you know, on a summer afternoon, the grid's getting loaded and loaded and loaded. And, oh, shit, we're in trouble. The grid's about to go down. Well, they have peaking plants. They have like three or four times as much generating capacity as they actually need to cover that one summer day in August when everybody has their air conditioner on. And the way they cover it is with peaking plants. They're just big-ass turbines, like a big-ass jet engine. They can throw a switch, and in 30 seconds, 